All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 26th day of September in the year of our Lord, 2023. And as usual, I'm going to take on the majority of what's called Christianity, the great majority of what's called Christianity, for believing false doctrine, for inventing false doctrine. Uh, and I'm going to talk about baptism. For the majority of what's called Christianity, Water baptism is essential for salvation. Either infant or adult, uh, Churches of Christ, typically, the, uh, of the Restoration uh, Movement variety, uh, hold water baptism to be essential to salvation. Others, Roman Catholicism, and I assume Eastern Orthodoxy too, um, it's hard to find a defined set of doctrine for them, which can be good or bad. Uh, Protestantism, generally speaking, uh, water baptism, Lutheranism, uh, Anglicanism, uh, Reformed, not quite so much, but some, yes. Uh, it's still considered a means of grace, but it's a little bit uh, weak in there. Not Anabaptists. No, they understood the Bible said faith. Uh, Luther was roundly criticized for his German translation of the New Testament because he translated uh, uh, Martin, uh, Paul and Luther as saying, uh, the just are saved by faith alone. But the context clearly indicates that Luther was right. That it's, Paul's point is it's faith, not works. Faith alone. And so Luther was uh, right to clarify that point, especially considering the times he lived in. When, well, it's the same times today, really, that the vast majority of Christendom held to the uh, salvation through sacraments. And that's still the vast majority of Christendom. Not biblical Christianity. Unfortunately, some people... Uh, do read the Bible, but they don't read it uh, to try to understand what it's teaching. And it does take a while because it's so contrary to what we've been taught <clears throat> for so many years. It's like freeing your mind from the United States and the worldview of America. And you realize, man, it is wicked. It is wicked to its very core. It is truly antichrist. It is. It's like the education system. It's anti-Christ. The whole thing is, is rotten to its very core. It's, it's the world. It's not just the United States. It's the world. The world in rebellion, and Satan is the god of this age, god of this world system. Not the god of God's, crea uh, the god of God's creation, but the god of fallen humanity. He uh, set humanity on that course, and he controls them primarily through lies and fear, which should tell you about who is in charge in Washington and basically every other place in the world. Uh, if you don't love the truth, you're not saved. But we're going to look at what the Bible says about baptism, and I'm going to look into a passage that doesn't even mention it. So let me set the stage here a little bit. Most of Christendom, I hate to call it Christianity, it's just like, and a good chunk of evangelicalism, for that matter. Uh, I'm not saying that all these people aren't Christians. I'm just saying their ideas on baptism are wrong. They are wrong, wrong, wrong. And Paul 
deals with a, a, another issue that applies directly. See, most of Christianity has the view, which is certainly true about Roman Catholicism and Lutheranism, and I'm, I assume Anglicanism, all. I'm not personally familiar with that as much, but I almost certainly is the case, uh, and um, Reformed Calvinists have the view that Old Covenant, uh, in the Old Covenant, the Covenant of the Law, circumcision has now been replaced in the New Covenant by water baptism. And, for example, the infant baptizers, what the, the paedo-baptists, what they do is they, they justify the baptism of infants based on the Old Testament practice of circumcision. You had you were supposed to circumcise your your children. I can't remember it was the tenth day or or something like that after birth. Uh, it was relatively soon after birth they were to be circumcised. But the thing is, these people, people like Augustine, for example, were woefully ignorant of the scriptures, especially understanding the scriptures. Their understanding of God and everything else came from other sources, like pagan philosophy and the church of the day, rather than actually seeking to understand what God teaches in the scripture. They were very, uh, very we, well, on the other hand, we have so much more resources available today. Uh, you can go to any practically any big box store and find Bibles on sale or, or for sale there. At least currently, although they've they've been diminishing in quantity and quality, it's almost impossible to buy a good Bible at the, any of these stores. They get extra cheap versions. Uh, they may look good on the outside, but uh, they're usually fake leatherette covers and bad bindings, and don't waste your money. Don't waste your money on buying a garbage Bible. They won't last you more than a year or two. Of course, that might be all you need, but uh, or you're going to buy one for somebody that's probably not going to wear it out, you know, like your grandmother. You want a giant print one, you can probably find that at Walmart. Just make sure it's not a junk translation. That might be harder to find. No NIVs, or worse, no NLTs. No living Bibles, none of that stuff. That's junk, absolute junk. It's uh, man's words, not God's words. The translation is just so bad. They're paraphrases. But we're, let's, we're going to look at Romans, Paul, which especially Romans is the theology of the New Testament. Not the only place, but Paul here, in, the purpose of his letter is to share uh, the understanding of salvation, God's purposes, and how we're saved, and all these things, especially in the book of Romans. Some fundamentalist Baptist churches, large Baptist churches in Michigan, I think they're still doing it, with large printing operations, I mean big, big commercial press, presses, uh, big, they, they printed millions of copies of a booklet of John and Romans, the Gospel of John and the uh, Epistle to the Romans, in multiple languages. I know down at the border, they would get, you could get, they'd give you cases of these John and Romans books. And they weren't little tiny things like you, the major publishers did, these little tiny things that are worthless because you can't read them. But no, they were, you know, they were folded 8 by 10 or 8 by 11 paper uh, and uh, with uh, legible print. But those two books are the most important books in the New Testament as far as the content. Uh, the, you, the Gospel of John, because the, the other Gospels are more the facts of Jesus' life but the Gospel of John goes into uh, much more in depth. I, I think John, who was the closest of the apostles to Jesus, uh, he was the last one to write a Gospel, and I think he was aware of, of what uh, Matthew and then um, Mark and Luke, which were secondary sources, but 
Matthew had written. And he just, there was some material that he just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of. Like the uh, John chapter 3, the visit of Nicodemus by night. None of the others included that. And I think John uh, saw that lack, moved by the Holy Spirit to include that stuff. So uh, anyway, uh, Romans uh, and, and God chose Paul to basically write the theology. None of the other uh, writers really get into the theology, other than the writer of uh, Hebrews uh, gets into the theology of, of the superiority of the new covenant of, of salvation in Christ. Some people don't even like the word covenant. The Bible does. And some people hear covenant theology, well, they, that's a different thing. They, don't, they hear the word covenant and the alarm bells go off. I hear the word dispensation and alarm bells goes off. But yeah, there, there's, uh, there's something, also there's something called New Covenant Theology, which is not perfect, but closer than, than Reformed Covenant Theology, for sure. It definitely makes a distinction between the Old Covenant and the New, which Reformed Theology doesn't. Plus, Reformed Theology invents hypothetical covenants. Thou, no, no inventions allowed. Okay, if the Bible doesn't teach it, don't preach it. So here, I'm going to look at the issue of baptism, because it's, it's, it's something that bothered me. I was raised as a Lutheran, baptized as an infant. Supposedly that made me a Christian. Then I was confirmed. Yeah, confirmation is really evidence that even historic uh, uh Christendom, trying to struggle for a word there, Christendom does not regard infant baptism as sufficient in and of itself. And a discussion I had with a Lutheran pastor not too long ago, uh, sort of like, I didn't even really get into this, but he brought it up. How, you know, I, I brought up the issue of Luther. He was like this double-minded man where he was, on the one hand, very strong on salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. And then he would also taught infant baptism as the way of salvation. <sighs> Augustine definitely was, uh, gave a really bad example of that. And Luther was an Augustinian monk. Uh, Luther, uh, Augustine, I'm doing this off the top of my head, so I'm probably going to be <laughs> not quite exactly right. But Augustine mentions an example, and he, I think he uses this to justify uh, predestination and uh, to show that, it, that human beings don't have any issue at all. He was the, the proto-Calvinist, was Augustine. And anyway, he, he gives the example of two women with two uh, young children. And one woman is a devout Christian, and her, her child is dying, so she tries to rush him to the church to get him to be baptized. Now, this is taught today. I, I remember as a Lutheran, we were told that, uh, that if and we were taught that in an event of an emergency, anyone can baptize. So if there's a child dying, for example, in the hospital, anyone can baptize them as long as you use the proper formula. And I baptize thee in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then sprinkle some water on them. That's in order to get them saved. And the, the, the uh, uh, Lutheran minister sort of said, well, God can give faith to, a, to an infant. John the Baptist was filled with his from his mother's womb with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, but God had chosen him to be a prophet. That's not true of everyone. And he wasn't baptized as an infant either. I didn't bring that up, but yeah. Should, no, he was just circumcised. Uh, circumcision has no promise of being filled with the Holy Spirit. So uh, anyway, circumcision is, re is related. It was They use that as an example, an excuse for infant baptism. Christendom especially Roman Catholicism, is more of a, re, re, uh, a reversion or a, a, what's the right word, a going back to, let me just use common language, a return to Old Testament forms with the priesthood and temples 
and an altar and all this stuff is really modeled more after either paganism or Old Testament uh, Mosaic law. It's not New Testament. None of these things were present in the New Testament. Uh, no temple necessary. No priesthood necessary. We have one priest. That's Jesus Christ. He's the only one that's necessary. And he already atoned for us. Oh, it's, it's, it's a relationship with him. That's what matters. That's the only thing that matters. Faith in him. Not faith in a church. Not a faith in a system of doctrine. Faith in Christ himself and what he did for us. Faith in the gospel. He is the gospel. He is the good news. He is God's salvation. He is eternal life. He is our righteousness. So we're going to look at Romans. And I'm going to start at Romans chapter 3 a little bit here. Starting at verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds, literally works of law, not deeds of the law. It's literally works of law. Period. Uh, no flesh will be justified in his sight. In other words, through obedience to principles. Now, Baptists are really great in translating law into principles. By, th by, by No, it's not legalism. We only follow principles. Well, uh, the word namas also includes principles. If you do this, good things will happen. If you don't do this, bad things will happen. That's called law. Or regardless of how you you try to get around that, uh, I found Baptists are often a bit confused because they don't understand the new covenant either. I don't recall a Baptist ever preaching a, a fundamentalist, uh, certainly not a Southern Baptist, a, a independent fundamentalist Baptist ever preaching on the new covenant. Shameful, shameful, shameful. A lot of them think the book, uh, the Epistle of Hebrews, wasn't even written to to non-Jews. Well, none of the new epi uh, New Testament epistles were written to 21st century Christians directly. Anyway, they were written to particular churches or regions. Doesn't change the fact that they apply. Therefore, by I'm going to say by the works of law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge or the consciousness of sin. See, if there is no law, there's no sin, because sin is a violation of the law. God said, don't do it. So if you do it, that's sin. Your conscience, if you did the same thing, if, if Adam and Eve had eaten of the tree of knowledge and God hadn't told them not to do that, there would have been no violation. There would have been no sin. They could have done exactly the same uh, thing, but because God had forbidden it, it became sinful. They could have eaten of the tree of life. There was no commandment that told them not to do that. Bad choice, Adam. Uh, bad choice. I wonder if... Well, actually, probably not. I was thinking uh, he must have felt terrible after that, but I doubt it. Because his first act when confronted with his sin was to blame his wife and to blame God. That just shows you that he was already dead in trespasses and sins. He was, his, he was already deeply fallen immediately after the act when confronted by God. What does he do? He blames his wife. He blames God. This woman who you gave me, she made me eat it. Yeah. Human beings have doing, been doing the same thing ever since. Oh, man, I probably blame my brothers and sisters for things I did. And I was blamed for things that I didn't do, too. That's what happens when you get six brothers and sisters. Hmm. You're the oldest. Oh. So... What's he saying here? But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed. The, the right Being right with God. A way to be right with God, apart from the law, apart from keeping the law, is, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The glory of God here, I am absolutely convinced, is 
uh, God's purpose in creating man to be his image. Falling short of the glory of God is falling short of the of being truly the image of God. To be the image of God is to be the glory of God. Jesus Christ is the glory of God. He is the express image of God. And those who trust in him will are predestined to be conformed to that image. That's where predestination really comes in. What God is predestined to do with those who believe in Christ. All purchased and paid for already. You don't have to work at it. Just like people that try to, to make themselves holy or make themselves more devout by, by going through a bunch of exercises, spiritual exercises, reading the Bible 10 chapters a day and doing this, spending uh, an hour in prayer every morning and stuff like that. God's not impressed. By the works of law shall no flesh be justified. No, you're justified by faith apart from works. So all your efforts will not make you more acceptable to God, but rather perhaps cut you off from God's salvation because you're putting your trust in your works. Oh, I tithe, therefore God's going to bless me. Guess what? You're trusting in law, not in Christ. There's no commandment in the New Testament to do that anyway. It seems that preachers forget that. You know, these dispensationalists that believe that, correctly believe that we're not under the law, but we're under Christ in the New Testament. They seem to always import that commandment from the Old Testament law, or at least the part they like. They don't, they don't import the whole thing. Especially about buying strong drink and having a party with it. That's actually in the law. Part of the tithe was supposed to be for celebrating uh, the Lord, and that included purchase of alcoholic beverages. They never mention that, do they? They edit the Bible by silence. So the best way to realize it is there's nothing in the New Testament that tells you to tithe. Don't believe it. Don't believe them at all. Just dismiss them as confused or deliberately trying to, through fear, get you to take, give them more money. It's a temptation, I suppose. I hate it. Personally, I... Uh, Every, every place I've been a pastor, I've hated taking offerings. And on occasion, I've forgotten. Maybe there was some deacon that reminded me. I said, what do we need that stinking money for anyway? You know, that the, the church I was at, the pastor in, in Bismarck, Illinois, about 10 miles north of here, we could have had the entire congregation meet in the parsonage. <laughs> It typically had, I don't know, 12, 15 people. We could have done that in the living room there. It had one room, the living room parlor area. It's actually a nice layout. Bedrooms are really small, but there's and only two of them, which wasn't quite adequate. But, uh, yeah, you could have put 15 people in that room without a problem. <laughs> Didn't need that old building. That was built to hold like 150, maybe. At least 120. You know, it was like a tenth full. So there's there no fighting over pews there. You had two or three to yourself. They spread out evenly all over the place. They wouldn't even take their Bibles home with them. They'd just leave them there in the pew. I'm sort of getting on a rabbit trail, aren't I? But... Uh, I, I, with a devilish guy that I was, remember one time I moved their Bibles around. I was sort of ups, you know, a little bit picked at their, or, um, upset, you know, why, why aren't you taking your Bibles home with you? In other words, you don't read them at all during the week anyway. You just leave them here as a seat marker. So I moved them around a bit. They didn't like it. Okay, back to the important thing. Instead of old preacher's tales here. Not a truth, though. I'm not making this stuff up. Oh, my. 
how does God put up with us? Because of the cross. That's the only reason he can. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Again, that's, that's we are created to be his image. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood. In other words, Christ's blood took our sin off the table. He paid for it. We had a pile of IOUs. I owe you my death because of my violations of your law. Jesus paid those IOUs in full. But it only applies to those who trust in him, who are in Christ. He, paid, he, he died for the sins of the whole world, but to partake in his work, his propitiation, you have to be in him through faith. You have to belong to him. It doesn't cover rebels. It doesn't cover people that don't care. It doesn't cover people that do not believe, who reject the gospel. It only covers those who trust in him. Justified freely by his grace through faith. Okay, I'm going to go skip down now to chapter 4, which is really what I want to talk about, and baptism. Again, remember that baptism, New Testament water baptism, especially infant baptism, is justified, especially the infant baptism, on the basis of Old Testament law and the, uh, the commandment to circumcise your children as infants. You know, if it wasn't done then, it'd be done later, but uh, they it bought as we'll see here what is the purpose of circumcision is it to save are you saved by circumcision no and by implication the same thing applies to water baptism which is why see in the new testament if water baptism was essential to salvation it would be repeatedly taught explicitly taught and it's not why is it so sad? why was paul so indifferent to it it's, and he, he tells the people in corinth thank god i didn't baptize hardly any of you lest you would say you'd baptize into paul because and i mean also it comes out of jewish tradition the tra tradition of conversion of a gentile to a Jew involved ritual baptism. There was all kinds of ritual baptisms. It was a symbol of cleansing. But under the law, it that was only a shadow of the reality to come in Christ. We're not under law, we're under the Christ. He is our law, he himself. He is our Lord. Chapter 4, what then shall we say uh, that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? Again, about salvation through grace, by grace through faith. That's what he's all talking about. That's what the first 10 chapters of Romans are about. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ, not of works. That's Paul's great theme. People can't get it through their thick heads. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast of, uh, but not before God. For what does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He believed, he trusted God. And God regarded him as righteous because he believed him. Now, to him who works, keeping commandments, doing things to earn God's favor, wages are not counted as grace, but a debt. If you earn it, it's something that's owed to you. 
Your wages aren't a gift unless you didn't do any work. Uh, Hunter Biden, perhaps. In other words, your employer, oh, you're absolutely useless, and, but I'm going to give you some money anyway because I feel sorry for you. That's grace. No, but if you had to do some work for it, you had to earn it, it's not grace. It's, it's wages. It's what you're owed, justly owed. See, wages have to do with justice. Grace is not justice. Grace is what's not just. But God's uh, taking that off the taking justice off the table by paying your debts himself. That's grace. He paid it. Now to him who works, his wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. That has to be one of the most radical statements in the Bible. Believes on him who justifies, who declares as righteous the wicked. Justifies the ungodly. His faith is accounted for righteousness, regarded as righteousness, counted as righteousness. Not your good works, they're counted as filthy rags. But the fact that you believe in God and what God does has done for us in Christ, that's counted for righteousness to us. We are regarded as righteous because we believe in Christ and what he did for us on the cross. Blessed is the man to whom, or bless, excuse me, just as uh, David also described the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. This is not, has nothing to do with the law. This has nothing to do with obedience. It has everything to do with trust, faith in Christ. So apart from obedience to the law, God has a system of righteousness that has nothing to do with obedience. It has everything to do with trust, believing God. Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're all in the same boat. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. That's what Jesus did for everyone who trusts him on the cross. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute or reckon or count sin. In other words, he disregards your sins. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not look at your sin. Doesn't count it. This is pretty radical, isn't it? Uh, free gracers will take just this and they forget the part that God actually does change our hearts too. So that's, that's their problem. They, they want to be justified sinners that still love their sin and are still rebels against God. No, when God saves you, he changes your heart. So you're no longer a rebel against him. Yeah, so if you, if people that, that, ref, that get all upset about uh, calling Jesus Lord, they're still rebels. Their heart hasn't been changed. It's not about MacArthur's lordship salvation. Don't listen to MacArthur. But the fact is that the earliest Christian confession is Jesus is Lord. And if you can't call him Lord in truth, you haven't been saved. It's not something you do to be saved. It's something that you do because you've been saved. And God has given you a different heart, a different spirit. You're no longer a rebel against him. It, means, it doesn't mean you're sinless, but God doesn't even count your sins. And this is difficult for Christians to deal with. They, they always want to put one foot back in the law. They try to get blessed by God from obedience to Old Testament commandments like tithing or whatever. It doesn't work that way. That's not what the new covenant is about. It's about God's work, not ours. 
We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. He's the one that does it. He's the one that causes us to walk in the, those good works. They're work, really God's works, not ours. Not something we come up with. It's something God does. Everything about the Christian is we're God's workmanship. If you're not, if you're a self-made man, guess what? You're not going to heaven. Uh, no, it's not about that. You should, even if you don't understand it initially, you know something happened. And you know there's something different in you. Now to him who works, uh, excuse me, I've been there. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only? Choose. Or upon the uncircumcised also? Gentiles. For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. Now you can go back in the Old Testament and read all about this in Genesis. How then was it accounted? Or when was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. Now think of, think of this in terms of baptism. Because the, the church is, through the ages has equated baptism with just a different form of circumcision. So, was Abraham accounted... I'm just going to substitute the word baptized here so you get the understanding here. Was Abraham account, uh, was faith accounted to Abraham for righteousness? Was it while he was unbaptized or after he had been baptized? Well, while uncircumcised or was he accounted as righteous after he was circumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. He received the sign of circumcision. You could put baptism in there too, if you'd like. The sign of baptism, a seal of the righteousness of the faith that he had while still uncircumcised that he might be the father of all who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that uh, righteousness might be imputed to them also, and the father of circumcision to those who are not only of the circumcision, but also walk in the steps of faith. Without faith, circumcision is nothing. It just makes you guilty which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. He had faith and was regarded as righteous before God because of his faith before he was circumcised, and then God gave him the sign of circumcision as a reminder to him and to all his descendants. They had to be circumcised too. What was it about? It was to remind them that righteousness is by faith and not by works. Because that's what Abraham found wasn't Abraham's obedience that made him righteous. It was his faith in the promises of God. In God's sight. Because perfect obedience is only what's required. It can't, doesn't, there's no credit for being perfectly obedient. That is, that is simply what you're supposed to do. Everything else is sin. And only one man perfectly kept the law, and that was Jesus Christ. For uh, the promise that he would be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but this is the law of Moses he's talking about here, but through the righteousness of faith. See, all the descendants, the true children of Abraham are those who believe in Christ. For if those who are of the law are heirs, Faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. As John the Baptist said to the Jewish believers, do not think because Abraham is your father that you're right with God. God can raise up children to Abraham from these stones, he said. They thought they were righteous because they were Jews and sort of kept the law when they felt like it. The easy things like tithing, 
tithing the, the, the herbs of the garden. Yeah, anybody can do that. But how about the real law? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's written in the law of Moses, people. Jesus didn't make that up. He was quoting the law of Moses, the greatest commandments. Not of the ten. They were just a preamble, an introduction to the law. The Ten Commandments are not the center of the law. They were just the ABCs. To keep the real commandments, you have to be born again. Even then, your flesh doesn't keep those. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect, comma, because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. See, the law condemns. The law shows us our sin. The law makes sin alive. See, when there is no commandments, if there is no law, sin can't do anything. It can't violate anything. But sin is empowered by commandments saying, Thou shalt not. If you've had children or remember yourself, you know what I'm talking about. It energizes sin. It, 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 Paul talks about that later. Uh, it, he, it, sin became alive. The commandment came and the sin became alive. Probably when he was a young... Um, Man, maybe at his bar mitzvah. Suddenly he was responsible to keep the law. And what had not been, you know, before that, he didn't have to worry about it. And then suddenly he, the, he was responsible to keep it himself. He'd come of age, 12 years old. Yep. <laughs> Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace. In the beginning of the letter to the Ephesians, Paul talks about uh, uh, God not uh, willing that any, uh, uh, not allowing sinful human beings to boast in their salvation. If it was by works, then we could boast. Unless he says about Abraham here, then if Abraham was righteous through his works, then he has something to boast about. Even if he can't do it before God. No. See, in Christ there is no boasting. Because Christ did it all. Simply believing him. Nothing to boast about. We boast about Christ. Boast about what God has done for us in Christ. That's the only thing to boast about if you're a Christian. You're, he's the center. He's the one we worship. If you're worshiping yourself, you get the wrong God. <clears throat> So as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of him who, uh, 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 whom he believed, that is God, who gave life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Yeah, this is what, uh, by the way, this is why uh, name it and claim it people, they, they think that they bring things into existence by their words. They think they're God. They're going to find out. People like that uh, Bethel Church, Johnson, and uh, Kenneth Copeland. Uh, God's got a place for them prepared. It's not in heaven. Not in his presence. Not in his loving presence, at least. Because they, they are utter they're sorcerers they practice sorcery and witchcraft that's what all sorcery is about satanism is about doing your own will getting god or the devil or angels to do your will and a lot of the pentecostals and charismatics that's what they're all about 
they're not interested in what God wants. They want their will done. They want to be healed. They want to be wealthy. They want this. They want that. That's what I was. That, that that's where my prayers were before I was saved. It wasn't until after I was saved that I had a concern about what God wanted. So it's all about if if your idea of God, it's all about getting God to do things for you. You need to get saved. doesn't mean we don't have needs and we're supposed to make them known god wants us to make our needs known he already knows they exist but when we ask then he can then we know when he answers that he answered it's amazing how many churches don't expect god to answer prayers they don't and if somebody actually has a prayer answered it's like Wow, did you hear about that? Instead of it being a daily thing, you know. I'm not surprised when God answers prayer. Which he does regularly. Oh God, we, we can't have that hurricane come through here. You know what we'll do to all these people out here. Could you please move that away? In your grace. So we got to pray according to God's grace and mercy and his will. And knowing he doesn't want to destroy sinners, their own sin is doing that to them. But when we pray according to the will of God, God answers. And you can see amazing things. You can, of course, you don't know, and there's probably was, was thousands of other people praying too, but how many people pray is not relevant as the scripture makes clear. Uh, Elijah was one man, just a regular person like everybody else, and he prayed and it didn't rain for seven years. Considering how badly we need rain, that, that would be, rain is essential to life. That would be a, a real, uh, to do that, you'd, it ha you could only, you'd have to pray that because God wanted you to pray that particular thing. Not your own plans, God's plans. That's what prophets are. They don't run their own lives. They speak for God. He's the one that puts the words in their mouth. Unlike all these prophets on uh, YouTube, which are false prophets, every last one of them. God has already spoken. He's not going to add anything to it. He's, it's sufficient. The faith was fully delivered onto us in the New Testament. Anything that was added after that is not the faith delivered once for all onto the saints, which completely condemns Rome and most of what else is called Christianity as far as the added things. Again, even Rome still has the gospel buried under everything. Until Francis gets done with it, then there won't be anything but Satan left. He is Satan's Pope. Through and through. Two horns like a lamb, but a mouth that speaks like a dragon. Not the only one like that, though. Who, contrary to hope, in hope believed so that he might become the father of many nations, according to what was, was spoken. Quote from God, his promise, so shall your descendants be. As the stars of heaven and the sand of the seas. He wasn't talking about the Jews. There's never been more than um, uh, 10 or 15 million of them at one time. That's hardly the sand of the sea or the stars of the heaven. Uh -uh. No, uh, all those who are children of Abraham through faith in God. That lets out most Jews. When I was in Israel, I was rather shocked. Back in the 80s, I was rather shocked to find out that the majority of Israel was, the Jews in Israel were secular. In other words, unbelieving Jews. They didn't practice even Judaism. 
And Judaism is not even Old Testament. No, it's something else. It's a corruption, the corruption of the Pharisees. Orthodox Judaism is just a continuation of the Pharisees. That's what it is. Uh, and then there's other kinds of Judaism that has a lot more in common with modern-day uh, uh, United Methodists than with anything having to do with God. Hmm. At least the United... No, they're not the only ones. If the church has a rainbow flag in front of it, you know they're not of God. They are giving God the finger, quite literally. Declaring their rebellion against God and his word. Well, if you want to do that, fine. God isn't restraining you, apparently. But just know the consequences. Those that practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. I would rather you repent. God would rather that you repent and turn to him and be saved. All you got to do is believe. He'll put away your sins for you. You can, don't say, I can't do it. You don't have to do it. There's been so much bad teaching from Pentecostals and others that, well, first you've got to repent of your sins. Oh, yeah, and, and Church of the Christ, too. And sometimes Baptists. You have to put away your sins first. Make yourself, clean yourself up. No, that's God's job. If you think you've got to, to get yourself right with God by keeping the law, keeping the Ten Commandments or something, and then I'll, I'll clean myself up and then I'll come to him. You'll never come to him. Because you'll never be clean. That's his work. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body, although dead, since he was about 100 years old. In other words, as far as begetting children, nothing was going to happen there. And the deadness of Sarah's womb never had become pregnant. She was like 90. Never had become pregnant in her entire life. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. He believed God. God told him, you'll have a, a son and it won't be through a surrogate like, the, like um, Ishmael. Nope. You'll have your own natural son. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. They thank God that God was going to bring it to pass. And being fully convinced that what he had promised, he, that is God, was also able to perform, therefore it was counted to him for righteousness. And it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus Christ, from, uh, Jesus our Lord from the dead. Okay, now as far as baptism goes. Was Abraham counted as righteous before or after he was circumcised? Before. And circumcision was given as a sign or a seal that his righteousness is a reminder that his righteousness is by faith in God and not of works. It doesn't come from the flesh. Now, of course, they totally perverted that. And they thought, well, I've been circumcised. I'm born of, of Judah or something. Therefore, I'm God's. No. See, even in the Old Testament, if you didn't keep the covenant, your circumcision counted for nothing. But under the law, no one was saved. Abraham was regarded as right with God. What do we mean by righteousness? That God counted him as being right with him. Because Abraham believed God. And that alone. 
Now, do you see the problem with infant baptism? It has nothing to do with faith. That's a problem. The only legitimate form of baptism is believer's baptism, and that is something that is not necessary for salvation because you're already saved when you submit yourself to be baptized by the church. It's a testimony to the fact that you've been saved. It's a declaration that God has saved me. I have faith in Christ, and I want to identify with his people. That's what it is. Nothing more. It is not essential to your salvation because you're already saved. And those who teach it is are teaching a system of works. It's, the New Testament is absolutely clear. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Sacraments, ordinances, works have nothing to do with it. So we're baptized and probably moved by God to that because we desire to do the will of God and to identify with his people. It doesn't do anything for an infant. See, the, the scripture Paul teaches that an infant of a believer is, has a different status before God simply because he is a believing parent, at least while they're, you know, young. God sees them differently because of they're a child of a believer. So baptism, he didn't say they're, they're right with God, they're okay because they were baptized as an infant. See, the New Testament knows nothing of infant baptism. There are no uh, people infer it in places like households being baptized, but that's an inference. That is not an explicit fact. And inferences prove nothing. They're just guesses, wishful thinking. But this, this teaching here about Paul about circumcision uh, that Abraham was regarded by God as righteous prior to circumcision totally blows baptism out of the water as far as being necessary for salvation. Because Abraham was already saved, quote, regarded as righteous with God, right with God, prior to him being circumcised. And believer's baptism is the same thing. You're right, you're already right with God. You've already been saved. And therefore, baptism is just a testimony of that, a declaration of that, and a desire to, to declare yourself as a believer to the church, to become part of that community because they can't see in your heart. God knows, but a public declaration before the church, a confession of faith in Christ was always part of baptism. And infant baptism was unknown for several centuries, as far as we have any records of anything. So, uh, and as far as Church of Christ, you, you, they have like five things you must do to be saved. You must do, that's works. Biblical salvation is you believe God and what he has done for you and trust him to do his work in you. Salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is God's work. They don't understand that. Uh, churches of Christ, you know, tradition, I'm talking about traditional churches and because they're not, you know, a hierarchical denominational structure, there are probably some out there someplace that are better than that. But everyone I've ever run into regards salvation or baptism as essential to salvation. If you're not baptized, you're not saved. It doesn't save you exclusively, but it's necessary as far as they're concerned. They're wrong. They're teaching a false gospel. They're teaching a gospel of works. Five things you must do. And that's why they were so popular for a while is because five things you can do, sort of. I think it was hear the gospel, believe the gospel, 
repent of your sins. There, there's some variations about it. Repent of your sins. Say, yeah, there, stop sinning. And uh, uh, be baptized for the purpose of your remission of sins. They believe that baptism actually takes your sin away. Water baptism. No, we're justified by faith, not by water baptism. And then live the Christian life. So, And, and every time you sin with them, you're lost. So you have to repent and ask forgiveness. But in that time in between, but your sin, and of course, if you forget to confess a sin, then you're toast. There's no hope there. They have no gospel. Like I found out about the Nazarenes, at least, you know, as far as their official theology and what I heard at a particular church, they had no gospel. Christ and Christ crucified was not front and center. They were following it tradition, not Christ. I could never understand it. Why don't they believe what God has said in the scriptures? They didn't. They were doing their own thing. Which is what happens, I suppose, in 99% of the churches in this world. Well, regardless of the denomination, they're doing their own thing. One way or the other. Or the Pope's thing or whatever. Not doing what God says in the scripture. See, just reading the Bible isn't enough. You, need, you, you have to seek to understand it. Understand what it means. Why God says these things. Don't you want to understand God? Don't, don't you want the mind of Christ? The scripture says we have the mind of Christ. Just have to trust him. To give you understanding. Oh, I'll work at it. I'll study, study, study. Won't work. The flesh can never make you what you're supposed to be. Only God can. And water baptism can only make you wet. It has a purpose. But we have to understand everything is according to God's purpose. God's purpose for water baptism is not salvation. It's simply to confess your salvation before the church. Because they can't see your heart. God knows you've been saved, but they don't. So, uh, does that help? I hope so. I remember being really troubled by some of these things because I had been sprinkled and other people said, oh, you got to be baptized. And, and uh, eventually, I, God convinced me of what I should do, and it wasn't about salvation. It was about simply doing what God wanted because I loved God. I love God. That's, what, that's what's important. Do you truly love him? Has he put his love in you? Without that, it doesn't matter what you do.